This podcast contains content that some listeners may find distressing. It contains depictions of real-life traumatic events, including commentary around significant injuries and death. It is not suitable for children, and listener discretion is advised. You know, terrorists only have to get lucky once. We have to get lucky every time. You can only do that by working closely together and understanding where each other's risks, appetites are, and then working through that. I feel like we just work together as an organisation really well because of the responding to the enormity of an incident like Bali. There was a period there where I just was really proud of what we'd, we'd done as an organisation in such a short period of time. There was a high level of preparedness for mass casualty, but we had never attended a mass casualty event of this scale or complexity in terms of the numbers of deceased, in terms of the complexity of deployment into a foreign country and sustaining that operation for such a period of time. I think it was an extraordinary group of people that we had. I would have worked for free. I absolutely would have, and I think that most others would have as well. Now, what you've just heard are the voices of some of the people involved in Operation Alliance, a unified response to an horrendous act of terrorism on the night of October 12, 2002, in Bali, right on Australia's doorstep. Throughout this podcast, you've heard first-hand accounts from those involved in this operation, whether they were helping the injured, looking for forensic evidence, or assisting the investigation to identify suspects and bring them to justice. More than just an alliance between Australian and international law enforcement teams, the operation was a major turning point for the Australian Federal Police. It built many long-lasting legacies in terms of the security of our region. I'm Ray Martin, and coming up, we'll explore some of those legacies and how Operation Alliance not only changed the AFP, but also those men and women within it. The AFP was first established in 1979. It was formed as a direct response to the Hilton Hotel bombing in Sydney the previous year. In that incident, three people died when a bomb was detonated outside the hotel, where a Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting was being held. In the years following that tragedy, the chances of a terrorist attack in Australia appeared less and less likely. So the AFP developed capabilities beyond counter-terrorism capabilities that focused on issues such as money laundering, human trafficking and international drug syndicates. Likewise for most Australians, the idea that an act of terrorism could once again impact their daily lives, well, it simply wasn't a consideration. But that all changed on September 11, 2001. The 9-11 terrorist attacks would fundamentally change the world we live in. Suddenly, the threat of terrorism, at any time and in any place, was a very real prospect indeed. But as an organisation built around countering terrorism, the AFP had already begun planning for the unthinkable to happen on Australian soil. I think the forensic area of the AFP had done a lot of training and a lot of planning in anticipation of responding to a major event. And in some respects, that went back to planning for the Sydney 2000 Olympics. Chris Leonard was the AFP's manager of forensic operations support based in Canberra. So 12 months out from the Sydney Olympics, the uh, chemical criminalistics team within the AFP, for example, established expertise in the area of explosive residue analysis. We had staff who underwent additional training. We purchased a whole range of portable instruments that could be used for explosive residue analysis. And we conducted a lot of training exercises so that if there was an actual bombing during the Sydney Olympics, that we had a way of responding, collecting samples, doing analyses. The crime scene examination area of the forensic group were also obviously undergoing training in the event of a potential incident during the Olympics. Now, thankfully, there was no such incident. The, the Olympics ran, ran smoothly. So there was always this planning, training, obtaining the necessary equipment, testing the equipment, et cetera, 
leading up to the Olympics that in later on in 2002, that was invaluable in terms of the response. At the time, Ben McDevitt was the AFP's General Manager of National Operations. I recall three months prior to September 11, being at a meeting of the senior executive and signing off on the AFP's next five-year strategic plan. And that was to start in about July 2001. And that strategic plan dealt with all the issues that we thought, all the wild cards that we could be asked to deal with. And it was strong on issues about corporate crime and the emerging environmental crime and the issues about climate change and what that might present from a policing perspective and cybercrime, which we called then high-tech crime and so on, not a mention of terrorism. September 11 happened three months later. That five-year strategic plan, throw it away and start again. It was just totally irrelevant. So it just shows the shift you know, in the whole agency thinking and approach and the positioning of the agency to suddenly be able to deal with this crime type that had sort of always been there. And in our history, historically, the AFP was born out of a terrorist incident, the 1978 Hilton bombings in Sydney, but we'd never had a focus on it. The Bali bombing, suddenly, this was right in Australia's playground We'd all been to Bali. We'd all been there on holidays. Suddenly, the stark reality of terrorism, I mean, even September 11, you know, what had happened there, that just the most horrific act that changed history. But it was on the other side of the world. It was in, it was in another hemisphere. And then suddenly, our own September 11 hit us on October 12, 2002. Following the 9-11 attacks, there was a heightened awareness of terrorism across the globe. In Australia, the AFP had already begun to identify potential capability gaps that might impact their ability to respond to a large-scale incident. After the experience of the US and 9-11, the AFP realised that our capacity to deal with mass casualty incidents and therefore a lot of death wasn't as good as it should be. We knew how it had to be done, but I don't think the AFP at that stage was really prepared for the enormity of having to deal with 202 deceased persons. That's Mick Travers, who in 2002 was working as part of the AFP search and rescue team. Mick was among the first to be deployed to Bali in the aftermath of the bombings. And Mick's role was to coordinate the crime scene and assist the Indonesian National Police with Disaster Victim Identification, or DVI an area requiring many more resources than the AFP had at the time. We went into Bali, and whilst I was on the first plane in, shall we say, behind that came a lot of experience, and it was really the first time we'd worked with other jurisdictions, or I'd worked with other jurisdictions. I'd had a bit of experience in my rescue squad, working with the New South Wales Police Rescue Squad, but to have not just Queensland Police, but Victoria Police, New South Wales Police, come to Bali over the next you know, weeks and months I think that made a real difference for us. They brought in skill sets that we hadn't really used much before. Before this, I think the biggest DVI operation that the AFP or certainly the rescue squad had done was of four deceased persons from a plane crash up in the, the Brindabellas a few years previous. So whilst we'd been through the process, something quite small and quite remote with, with known factors, obviously Bali was completely something different, a lot of unknown factors, unknown people. So having that uh, rest of Australia experience really helped us. The sheer enormity of the task that lay ahead for AFP investigators in Bali made the cooperation of state and territory police forces all the more imperative. Yet for Mick Travers and others who were some of the first to arrive from Australia, nothing could prepare them for what they were about to encounter. We had a few hours, probably very, very restless sleep, and then were taken along with some of the forensic members to Sangla Hospital. And that is probably, and I admit it very openly, that is probably one of the most horrific sights that I think I've ever seen in my life. You know, I'd been a police officer for a long time. I'd seen a lot of death. I was used to, to, to injuries. But coming into a, a hospital and literally walking amongst what was then several hundred bodies, 
just lying on the ground outside because obviously, obviously their mortuary was, was overwhelmed. And some of the bodies, you know, very, in very, very uh, poor state, shall we say. That was really what set me back. It was one that was difficult to understand, just seeing body after body after body, albeit some had been placed into body bags, but some were, were still in the open. These were unimaginable scenes of human tragedy, confronting the members of Operation Alliance. How do you even begin to tell relatives about what's happened to their loved ones? Although trained as an investigator, AFP officer Brett Swan was given the job of fronting the daily media briefings from Bali. Understandably, the media and families of the victims were desperate for answers. But as the Operation Alliance team worked through a complicated but necessary DVI process, those answers weren't always easy to provide. Yeah, that was kind of hard. And just trying to explain to them the DVI process. And of course, the AFP went out of their way to really put that out there, that we're doing this properly. How could you tell a family that their, their loved one, there's not really much left of them? Trying to identify them is a really, really hard thing to do. And it comes down to, to really keeping with the process, whereby we can actually give them something at the end of the day. That was a difficult part in terms of just making people understand that this was a bombing and there was a large volume of people that really were messed up in it, making identification hard. The mortuary in Indonesia at the time in Bali was um, was just horrendous. And so visiting that place and working in that place and thinking what that meant was, I think, difficult for people. That has some small memories for me that I'm that just that probably are strong. In 2002, Carl Kent was the head of ACT Policing Forensic Operations. Carl established the Operation Alliance Forensic Major Incident Room in Canberra. He deployed to Bali numerous times to oversee the forensic investigation on the ground, and that included the process of victim identification at the mortuary. Identifying those killed and returning them to their loved ones would become one of the most important objectives for the Operation Alliance team. In terms of the disaster victim identification work, the breakthrough moments come with your first ident. So the first identification and release of deceased, repatriation of deceased, both in Indonesia and also into Australia, was critical because it demonstrated that we had a system and that this system was highly reliable and would result in the repatriation of loved ones' remains to their families. Critical. It also gives a sense to those who are in the operation at the Ford Command Post that they are making a difference and to have trust in the processes that are now at play. The first victim of the bombings was identified within one week. The entire DVI process in Bali was completed within four months. Seconded from Queensland Police, Ken Ra was an integral part of the Bali DVI team, driven by the singular mission of providing families with some sense of closure. We're taking all these human remains, we're recreating and putting a name to that person. We're giving the remains back to the family and that gives them some sort of closure because the way people treat a mass fatality incident is totally different than if someone dies in a car crash, for example, because that happens all the time. In a mass fatality incident, they, you know, there's a panic and it's totally different and it affects them totally differently. So. You really have to do something positive for them to give their loved ones back to them. And that, that I think, is probably the reward to basically give them back their loved ones to prove that they have actually passed away. Because if they don't see a body and they don't get remains, they don't know whether the person's actually died in that incident. In the years following the Bali tragedy, the AFB expanded and developed many of its operational capabilities to the point where they'd be recognised as world leading. For Ken Ra, Bali marked a significant turning point in Australia's approach to DVI. We took the bull by the horns and we sat down, we created a, an Australasian DVI committee from all the states and the AFP and we'd meet once a year and we'd go through processes. We eventually established, a, we had already had a, a manual in Queensland for our DVI procedures, but we combined all the all the procedures and got standardised procedures right throughout Australia. And someone told me that Interpol actually used that to establish worldwide procedures. So what we've done in Australia, it is world leading. 
because we took it seriously and didn't say, yeah, it's only a part-time thing. Let's do it properly and let's, let's progress it. Kate Fitzpatrick was also part of the AFP's DVI team in Bali and one of those working to shape the future of the organisation's DVI capability. So from the point of view of my DVI experience, I had very little before Bali. Bali gave all of us an incredible insight into, on a large scale, how you've got to start like from scratch and build everything up and then how each of those systems play into each other and how if you have good procedures that everyone understands that are as simple as possible set up beforehand, you can make that all flow much easier and work well. I'd forgotten a lot of this as to the relationships that I had with those people I'd worked with in Bali who who even maybe I hadn't worked with but when I came back to Australia and we were all working together to build the capability of not just the AFP but of Australia and New Zealand in DBI, it was a really wonderful community to be part of who were all motivated by the same desire and that was to ensure that when these types of events occur, we're able to do the very best job possible. In the years following the bombings, the AFP's DVI expertise has been called upon to help identify victims in numerous global incidents, including the 2004 Boxing Day tsunami and the downing of Malaysian Airlines Flight 17 in the Ukraine in 2014. It's become a lasting legacy of Bali 2002. It's now an, it's a national capability. Whereas, you know, prior to Bali, it was just an ACT capability. But one of the other groups that came out of Bali was the family liaison officers. And that's ongoing and still works fairly regularly in all sorts of events, whether it's to do with international or, or local. Without a doubt, the cruelest of tolls from the Bali bombings was on those families who'd lost their loved ones. The scale of human suffering extended well beyond those caught up in the blasts. Passing on relevant and timely information to families, to witnesses and others affected by the disaster was critical to managing public expectations about the investigation. It was a lesson the AFP had to learn on the run. I was being screamed at by our senior executive as to why we were having negative stories on the front pages of papers around Australia with victims' families saying, I don't know what's going on, no one's talking to me, I don't trust the AFP, this is a, this is a joke. That's Andrew Colvin, who in 2002 was the AFP's National Coordinator of Counterterrorism. I came to that realisation very quickly, we weren't managing the family. So that was the genesis of the Family Liaison Officer Program, which the AFP is now known for worldwide. And in, in a great circle of life, I know that the UK police, who taught us how to do it in 2003, and two you know, good friends who I'm still in touch with today came out from the Met and said, you need a Family Liaison Officer Program or you're never going to get yourself out of this problem. Uh, and we instituted it there and then. Uh, we're now teaching the Met, and the Met have asked us about our Family Investigative Liaison Officer Program, and, and it's been used time and time again. It's used in our child sexual exploitation. It was used after M817. It's something that we hold up so high, rightly, and it came through pure not knowing how to, how to get ourselves off the front page of the newspapers where victims' families were rightly criticising us. Mike Nicholas was one of the first AFP Family Liaison Officers who worked with the families of victims. Mike and his colleagues were absorbing the grief of those families on a daily basis, an emotional toll that was shared with his Operation Alliance colleagues. When we were in Bali and we would deal with the families throughout the day, when we got back to our hotel off a night time, we were all together, we were all in the same boat. And that debrief, that friendship that we had was, I think that's what got us through the days knowing that each and every one of us was going through the same thing. My memories now are of the friendships that I developed, not so much the grief, 
over time that just goes away slightly. But the friendships that develop from that, I can recall each and every one of the families. They were the ones who got us through this as well. Every time I go to Bali, seeing those 202 names on that memorial, I stay and I I pay my respects to those people every time I visit there. It, it's, it is important to me. I think that one memorial gives me some comfort that these that we did a good job, that we brought all our loved ones home. Yes, it altered our, our lives, but it never defeated us. I think at the end of the day, we won, not, uh, not Terra. Terra didn't win. We showed them that we are resilient. Just that one memorial shows us that we, we won. Uh, there, is, there is peace because of it. So uh, I think that'll stay with me forever. Yes, I made a decision that I should go there. Now, you know, some people said, don't go too soon, but I felt instinctively that it was the right thing to go there, and I'm glad I did. As the Operation Alliance investigation rolled out, in the days following the bombings, many survivors and families of the victims wandered the streets of Bali, lost in grief. For some, they found comfort in a surprise visit by then Prime Minister John Howard. The thing that I remember most was comforting people, talking to them, and it's one of those occasions when you have to make a judgement as to how people who are grieving and bereaved and just lost a loved one, a son, a daughter, a wife, a husband, girlfriend, boyfriend, whatever. And you have to make a decision as to how you express your condolence and different people react to different forms of condolence. Some people want to engage you and want to grip you and listen to you and look you in the eye. Others uh, don't. And just to remember that it's all about them. It's not about you. It's not whether you feel comfortable or, or, or not. It's whether you are providing what little support you can possibly provide. And I remember that and I, I just hope in different ways I was able to provide some comfort and help. Kevin Cuthbertson was a bomb tech from the Australian Bomb Data Centre. He played a critical role in determining what had taken place with the explosions in Bali. And he remembers the Prime Minister's visit to the scene. Vividly, vividly. He was the leader of our country. He came down. There were obviously the protection party with him and all of the AFP members that were present on site at that time collected around him. He walked past Paddy's, but Paddy's was a closed shop. It was a bar and the front was set back off the street. He didn't see what had gone on in there. He walked to the Sari Club and he was at the uh, north edge of the Sari Club. And when he took the first view, it was, I noticed it, he visibly crumpled. It was a look of anguish. Um, how could this happen? That transferred through, I think, to everybody that was there. If you're not involved in this sort of investigation, seeing something like that for the first time, to them, is totally crushing. You're looking at a building that's burnt out and crushed flat. You're looking at a civilian building, another building across the road that's burnt out. There's a family killed in there. Vehicles burnt, debris everywhere, roofs off. It was crushing for him. He'd never seen anything up close like that before. AFP investigator Andy Thorpe also remembers Mr Howard's visit, and he believes it helped reinforce the sense of resolve within the Operation Alliance team. John Howard came to the forward command post to address the people that were there, and he was obviously devastated himself as to what had happened, but the message he gave was that whatever we could do to identify those responsible and bring them to justice, let's do it, you know, whatever it takes type attitude, which is pretty much how most of the people working on it were thinking at the time anyway, I mean, but it was basically, you know, don't, don't worry about the expense, don't worry about, don't worry about the time, just do what you can. So that's what we did. I was always glad to see in the years that passed evidence of cooperation between the Indonesian uh, intelligence authorities, the Indonesian police and their counterparts in Australia because we have a common interest in preventing 
attacks of this kind in the future. And we will never know because we can't know just how effective that cooperation has been uh, in deterring attacks that might otherwise have occurred. I suspect it's been very effective. The important thing is that the will is there, has been over the last 20 years, and we owe it to the memory of those who died in such uh, random, tragic circumstances to uh, do all we can as nations to prevent things like that happening again. Dr. Benny Mamoto is a former high-ranking member of the Indonesian National Police and a former investigator who worked non-stop on pursuing and interrogating the suspects connected to the Bali bombings. Indonesia merasa sangat terbantu dengan uh, dukungan dari AFP. Indonesia feels it was really helped through the support of the AFP because since the first Bali bombing, the AFP transferred technology and knowledge, with the result that handling cases now makes use of scientific crime investigation methods. This cooperation didn't stop merely with the problem of bomb terrorism, but it also resulted in the building of JC Lag in Semarang, an educational body then a central database that's used to train Polri officers and other agencies in handling terrorist issues. JCLAC is the Jakarta Center for Law Enforcement Cooperation. Established in June 2004, it's a center for training excellence that's overseen the development of thousands of law enforcement officers. It's another of the lasting legacies to come out of the Bali tragedy, as Graham Ashton explains. It was an important development to Indonesia, the establishment of JCLAC. We had a joint team on the ground operationally. Uh, we had Australian investigators and Indonesian investigators working together on the ground pursuing Jamal Islamir following the bombings and following the arrest of you know, Imam Samudra and other key members of JI. That then became an ongoing exercise where we could be working together to pursue terrorist elements in that country with us supporting the Indonesian police um, technically and in other ways that we could help them. That was proving to be a successful um, model, but it was very much low-key at the time. And we needed something that was a bit more of a permanent presence of our sense of our cooperation and our willingness to cooperate with Indonesia and send a message to Indonesia that this is something that's super important to Australia. After Bali bombings, I was appointed as the national manager for counterterrorism. So then I had this sort of national international responsibility for the AFP on counterterrorism. And so I was presented with this task of establishing the centre in Indonesia in about six or seven months. The Indonesians, we were able to negotiate with a great degree of goodwill on their part, some land at the police academy in Semarang in central Java. Oddly enough, right in the heart of JI country, right in their heartland. And then we had to get this place constructed and, uh, and uh, put together and then develop the training programs that we could deliver. Ultimately, we did get it constructed and opened just in the time frames that we were delivered. Thousands, not hundreds, thousands of police from all across Asia and across the rest of the world, actually, have attended programs at the JCLEC on forensics, on investigations, on crime scene management, on intelligence, and whole areas of cooperation and the partnerships that have been formed out of that single centre. I mean, that has been one of the strongest possible defences against terrorism globally is actually the establishment of that. General Manager of AFP National Operations at the time, Ben McDevitt, could see the organisation evolving almost overnight. And then back home, you know, while we're still working on our tactical and operational aims following the Bali bombings, we knew also it was time to cement and lock in the joint counterterrorism teams in Australia. Whilst we capitalise on this spirit of cooperation, we've engaged every police service in the country to be part of this joint effort in Bali, investigating multiple murders. Let's use that opportunity to also build and strengthen and put in place this framework back home. So if the unthinkable happens and something does happen back home, then at least we'll be able to continue this whole of Team Australia, certainly from a law enforcement perspective, in terms of our response to it. 
In 2002, Scott Lee deployed to Bali to replace Graham Ashton as the AFP's forward commander. Today, Scott is the AFP's Assistant Commissioner for Counterterrorism. He's witnessed the AFP's capabilities in this space grow exponentially over the past two decades. Our counterterrorism capabilities have evolved significantly since 2002, and we're very well positioned to respond to threats onshore and offshore. From my perspective, the response at that time was outstanding given there's such an early stages, but we are much more mature now in terms of our national frameworks here with our joint counterterrorism team arrangements. Now we have our high-risk terrorist defender teams because that's an evolving element now of our counterterrorism command, but very much in you know, a very mature now governance arrangement that exists between ourselves, ASIO, and our state and territory police. Internationally, we very much have you know, enhanced joint arrangements that sit in Southeast Asia or the Middle East that very much are there in terms of our coordinated joint activity, our information sharing, our capability development, very much a more mature framework and how, how we respond to these threats onshore, in our region, and also more broadly into other parts of the world. For AFP Commissioner Rhys Kershaw, Bali was not only fundamental to reshaping Australia's national security framework, it was also fundamental to reshaping the whole organisation. There was a time there where we were building, but we had to build and run. And I think that's when Bali happened. It accelerated our changes and our strategies to combat the threat. You know, if you go back pre-September 11, say in the US, outlaw motorcycle gangs were considered the number one threat from a national security point of view. And then, of course, it all changed with September 11. I think with Australia, we had to change as well, which we did. And now we're in a different era where we have complex terrorist threats, whether it's through, you know, ideologically motivated violent extremism or religiously motivated violent extremism. On top of that, we're now in the point where our Attorney General has come out and said, you know, national security threat is transnational serious and organised crime. So we're dealing with multiple national security issues, and that's where the AFP now is front and centre in combating those threats and working with all the agencies. So for us, we have to have that capability. We have to keep investing in our people and in technology and being innovative, you know, and adaptive and agile. For the AFP, the alliance formed with the Indonesian National Police has become one of the most important legacies from those dark days. It's a national treasure, that relationship we have between IMP and AFP, and we'll keep working together to keep our communities safe, which is what all of our goal is. In some respects, it can be said that the AFP has closed the circle when it comes to terrorism. Born out of a terrorist incident more than 40 years ago, The AFP, working closely with its local and international partners, now plays a crucial role in preventing terrorist acts designed to affect Australian interests. But perhaps more than any other incident in the organisation's history, the 2002 Bali bombings have had a lasting impact on those men and women of the AFP who lent their expertise and their dedication to the Operation Alliance investigation. Months after the bombings, Mark Lang, one of the first investigators deployed to Bali, travelled to Perth on an emotional mission. To reconnect with the players of the Kingsley Cats Football Club. I'd never been to Perth in my life and I wanted to catch up and just see how they were going because I'd seen them in this pool in Cooter, you know, at their lowest, wanting to find their mates. I was expecting to catch up with three or four of the boys and have a beer and say, how are you going? And there were people everywhere. If there wasn't a hundred, there was probably you know, getting up towards that. And, and here's me thinking, oh, I'm going to be catching up with a few people. Out of that group, this lady came up to me, never seen her before in my life, and she, she hugged me, I think. She hugged me and I said, I, and she said, thank you, thank you, thank you. And I said, what for? I said, I just did my job. She said, no, you didn't. AFP investigator Renee Colley worked with Mark in Bali. Renee also has a special connection with the Kingsley Cats, one that goes beyond just sharing the same hometown. They had a cleansing ceremony in Bali, probably around the beginning of November, and it was a traditional Balinese ceremony 
I think it was about cleansing and getting rid of bad spirits from the island. And a lot of uh, families, I think, that were still in Bali at the time attended. Uh, there was a lot of people that went, but none of the Kingsley Cats football team uh, could go. They'd all returned home. Thorpe had a football jumper that was sent up and I think from memory it had some autographs on it. It might have been the team that autographed it. I can't remember. And so I was from Perth and the team was from Perth. The jumper fit me. (laughs) So I wore it to the cleansing ceremony on behalf of that team so we could in some way be present for those people that couldn't make it. On October 12 every year, a group of people gather in the Sydney beachside suburb of Kuji to remember the victims of the Bali bombings. The memorial honours all those who died, especially the six members of the Kuji Dolphins rugby league team. The memorial is simple but powerful, and for former AFP forensic chemist David Royds, it's particularly evocative. There's a wonderful monument down at Kuji, which is a, um, a, you know, a statue of three three figures with their, like, three people stooped in grief and the the three rings in the top are interconnected. It's um, probably one of of the most powerful art forms I could ever possibly imagine because it sort of shows you how the relatives were united through a shared experience of horror. I, I, I get upset when I think about that. Of the hundreds of men and women involved in Operation Alliance, many of them are silent heroes. Throughout this podcast, we've spoken to others who felt comfortable enough to share their experiences, despite having witnessed some things which for you and I are simply unimaginable. The AFP and the lives of many of its members changed forever after the Bali bombings, and many of them have lasting memories of that time. And none will ever forget the night the lights went out in Bali. It's been 20 years, it's, it's still not easy for some people, you know, I get emotional about it still sometimes. It's, I guess, important for people to just know that the people that went there went there with the best intentions and did what needed to be done, and they were the right people. For me, it was a life changing moment in my life that I wish I didn't go through, but I'm stronger for having gone through it. I am easily startled, Um, I'm frustrated, I get angry. Can I connect all that? It's more that sort of, anything in life you have some regrets and you always wonder if you can do things better, but it's taken a long time to settle that in my own mind. To be part of that and um, ended up being successful in terms of providing some sense of justice to families and being able to capture those responsible and uh, provide at least some outcome for families who had been through so much. Felt very rewarding, and but at the time you felt like you were part of something significant, something historic, as it, what was happening in terms of Australia's history. This was a terrible thing, and look, the focus should be and is and needs to be on those who lost their loved ones in, in this atrocity. But I think we can also take some pride in the response. I think in terms of my career, it's absolutely the one thing that stands out that one, I've contributed to a really significant response and result and just what motivates you go to work each day. I mean, 20 years on and still motivates me to go to work. I think the Bali bombings was as good a test as you could ever plan for in terms of determining whether or not the response and subsequent laboratory work in the explosives area was capable of dealing with such an incident. And I, and I think it passed that uh, check with, with flying colours. We collected hundreds, thousands of hours of videos. And there's one video that was just before the Sari Club bomb went off. And it was people dancing on the dance floor. I can see the video today. I can even, I won't... I can even see the music. I know the, the song, and when I hear it on the radio today, it brings back that that was a song that was playing. Um, people don't believe it. It was it was a song at the time, um, Murder on the Dance Floor. 
I think for all of us who worked in that space for that period of time, there was a connection that endured, an understanding of what we'd all been through. Our journeys were all different. Some of us were more affected than others. Some of us found it really difficult to think or talk about this to this day. We all respect that, but we can talk to each other about it and support those that find that difficult. That hospital, for want of a better word, the medical centre, how dark, dark, damp, and the smell of that ward, I'll never forget. The closeness of feeling death and despair because it was just so bad, but then the shining light of seeing Nikki. And it sounds silly, if you, if you looked at a painting and then you saw a ray of, a, like a ray of, of light that's landing on it, that to me is the image I get. That's what took me over the edge to make me feel the way I felt and, and in tears. But that's what got me going back up the other side was, was, was that. And that's the image I live with. At the Bali site, there was an Indonesian, I think he was a village headman. He was Balinese. He took the attack very, very personally. He was always there. He was handing out water. He could see when you were down. I'm starting to crack a bit now. It's so strong, the feeling. Support, the ability to understand and help. We did make a lot of good friends, both in the AFP, with the locals, uh, everywhere we went. It was just really good and very supportive. It made me view my whole life in a totally different way. It made me feel privileged in a way to have been part of that. And the people that I met, that's probably, it's the people that I met that changed me, I think, yeah. We were getting towards the end of this. We just kind of held an informal barbecue out at West and, you know, for everybody that had been involved. And it's the only thing that gets me emotional. And when I talk about this is that um, I am very protective of my staff and, you know, what they do. That's the only time I get emotional about these sorts of things is, is I, I do not like my staff being criticised, you know, for anything they've done because everyone, you know, that's involved in these things does their absolute best. We were there to protect Australia as, as we could and, and we've learned up to 2002, 2002, you know, it really it slammed us in the face uh, and then after that, exponentially, we... we improved, we grew, we matured to what we are now. And uh, yeah, when I, I left in, in December of 21, I couldn't be more proud of the organisation that, that I'd left. And obviously I had that opportunity to, to look back at all the things that had occurred during my service. And, you know, Bali really stands out in that because I think that's a point in time when we, you know, we really, oh, I don't know, turned the corner, but perhaps started walking uphill. Just um, that little bit prouder of the organisation that we, you know, we were then and we, we've achieved now. I remember walking into the front of the consulate one morning, Consul General was standing there with a number of people and I walked across just to say hello and it turns out that one of the people that were there was the mother of a, her son had passed away um, as a result of the attack. And I still remember she gave me a hug at the time, didn't, didn't, didn't really say a word at that point in time, but she gave me a hug at the time and she found out who I was. And she made a comment to me that stayed with me forever really, and I think it will always, and then she said that, the how much of a benefit it had been to them trying to deal with the tragic circumstances knowing that Australian police were in Indonesia working with their Indonesian police colleagues to bring these people to justice and how that had helped them process their grief. I think as a police officer first and a commissioner second, we did everything we could uh, for the families and for, for those victims and, and I believe we did bring those responsible to justice. But it's never ending and we'll never give up and we'll never stop. Eighty-eight Australians were among the 202 people who died in the Bali bombings. They will never be forgotten and our hearts will always be with those grieving families and the survivors. Gail Airely, Belinda Allen, 
Rene Anderson, Peter Bazioli, Christina Betmalek, Matthew Bolwerk, Abby Borgia, Debbie Borgia, Geraldine Buchan, Stephen Buchan, Chloe Byron, Anthony Cashier, Rebecca Cartledge, Bronwyn Cartwright, Jody Kearns, Jane Cortine, Jenny Cortine, Paul Cronin, Donna Croxford, Kristen Kuno, Francoise Dehaan, Sylvia Delais, Joshua Deegan, Andrew Dobson, Michelle Dunlop, Craig Dunn, Shane Foley, Dean Gallagher, Angela Golotta, Angela Gray, Byron Hancock, Simone Hanley, James Hardman, Billy Hardy, Nicole Harrison, Timothy Hawkins, Andrea Hall, Adam Howard, Paul Hussey, Joshua Eilif, Carol Johnston, David Kent, Dimi Kotronakis, Lizzie Kotronakis, Aaron Lee, Justin Lee, Stacey Lee, Danny Lewis, Scott Lysart, Linda Makawana, Sue Maloney, Robert Marshall, David Mavrudis, Lynette McKeon, Marissa McKeon, Jenny Murphy, Amber O'Donnell, Jessica O'Donnell, Susan Ogier, Jodie O'Shea, Corey Poultridge, Brad Ridley, Ben Roberts, Bronwyn Ross, David Ross, Kathy Salvatore, Greg Sanderson, Catherine Seelan, Lee Sexton, Tom Singer, Julie Stevenson, Anthony Stewart, Jason Stokes, Behish Sumar, Nathan Swain, Tracy Thomas, Clint Thompson, Robert Thwaites, Charles Van Rennen, Jonathan Wade, Vanessa Walder, Jody Wallace, Shane Walsh Till, Robin Webster, Marlene Whiteley, Charmaine Witten, Jared Yo, Luisa Zervos. The opinions, beliefs, and viewpoints expressed by the individuals featured in this podcast do not necessarily reflect the opinions, beliefs, and viewpoints of the AFP. If the content in this podcast has caused you any distress, please contact Lifeline for support on 13 11 14. Operation Alliance, the 2002 Bali bombings is a production of the AFP. Written and researched by Nicole Gunn and Dave Carter. Audio production by Pro Podcast Production. Produced by Dave Carter on behalf of Media Heads. If you found this podcast informative, please take the time to share it, write a review and subscribe to the series on your favourite podcast app. To learn more about the work of the AFP, follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter and